This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I started Self Work about five years ago to try to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might be interested in hearing more about therapeutic issues, to those of you who've just been diagnosed with something that you're confused or curious about, and to those of you who might never darken the door of a therapist, but you're just curious enough to listen to Self Work. This is a bonus episode of Self Work. You know, at this point, I get bunches of emails from either publicists or publishing houses, meditation gurus, and advisors of every ilk who have the perfect guest for me to have on Self Work. It's a flattering problem to have, but there's no way I can respond to all of the requests, and I don't feel great about that. But I also frequently get requests for things I've never allowed or never done on my website or here on Self Work. They often start out with a generic, hey, not my name. And I must admit, that's maddening. I've heard from everyone, from experts on sexual lubrication to affordable vacations to trying to sell you, my listener, the one and only path to enlightenment. Those I don't mind not returning. They're such an obvious ploy. But then sometimes I get an email like this one that came a few months ago. Hi, Dr. Margaret. I hope this finds you in the middle of a smile. I smiled when I read that. First, thanks for the work you're doing in the world. It's very much needed. I'm Scott Shoot. I'm a bit of a dual agent. After a career as an exec at LinkedIn, coupled with a lifelong meditation practice, I now lead our mindfulness and compassion programs at LinkedIn. I'm very grateful to be able to do this work. It's a rare but growing field. Every day I get to help people change their mindset. My COVID project has been to write a book, The Full Body Yes is releasing on May the 11th, that was of this year. It's the classic hero's journey, very much story-driven, therefore it does not suck, and sometimes set in the work environment. I think that work can be just as valid a place for personal development as an ashram, monastery, or a backpacking trip across wild lands. I'm committing this next phase of my career to helping LinkedIn and other companies operationalize compassion, not just because it feels good, or it's the right thing to do, and it is, but because it's a strategic advantage. So this was very intriguing to me, learning and practicing compassion in the work setting. So I'm delighted today to introduce you to Scott Shoot. He's been featured on NPR, on Dan Harris's podcast, 10% Happier, which is a great podcast, by the way, and other radio shows and podcasts. We had a wonderful conversation, and maybe you'll get some ideas from him about setting up or establishing or even considering his ideas on compassion and how to set that up in your own workplace. I read his book, and a link to it will be in the show notes. It is a very good book. Very, very readable. But first, before we begin the interview... I want you to hear an offer from me and from Athletic Greens. It's a great way to start your morning going in the right direction. Athletic Greens came on board Self Work now a few months ago with an offer for Self Work listeners to try their product. And because of being a Self Work listener, you'd receive bonus products as a gift with a subscription. I don't really know how many of you have tried it, but quite a few I can tell. And I'd love to hear from you about how you're feeling. Please email me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com because I'd love to share your experience here on Self Work. So some of you are saying, what is Athletic Greens? It's a life-changing nutritional habit. Their daily all-in-one superfood power is your nutritional essential. It's by far the easiest and most delicious nutritional habit that you can add to your daily routine today and empower yourself toward better habits. And it's a lot more pleasant than eating celery, I promise you. I've never liked powdered things, but this one isn't too sweet, but also not too grainy. And I look forward to it in the morning. You're actually just getting optimal nutrition on a daily basis. And you don't have to take multiple supplements. Just one thing. I take a scoop a day and know that I'm getting 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood, and more. 
In fact, I just had my annual OBGYN appointment, and his last words to me were, make sure you're getting enough D3, and the supplement you receive as the self-work bonus with the subscription contains both D3 and K2. So I smiled and said, oh, I got that. I hope you'll try it. Both my husband and I love it and have kept it up now for several months because it's making a difference. So here's the link, athleticgreens.com slash self-work. That's, of course, HTTPS colon slash slash athleticgreens.com slash self-work. And I'll have that link for you in the show notes. So enjoy this bonus full episode of Self Work, where we get to meet and talk with Scott Shute. Hello, Scott. Well, hello. How are you? I so appreciate you being here on Self Work. I enjoyed reading your book. In fact, I got tickled. I had forgotten a notebook of some kind, and I was on a flight to Denver, and yeah. these are my notes. <laughs> <laughs> my husband Excellent. looked over there and said, are you even going to be able to read that? And I said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Fantastic. So into time management. I looked at the book is doing well and it seems to be well received. You've certainly been on a lot of podcasts. I mean, some of the (laughs) ones that I'd love to get on. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 35 so far, another 10 or 15 to go. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Lots of speaking engagements. So I'm I'm in the thick of it. Your style reminded me of Dan Harris with 10% Happier. It was a very story-driven kind of way of of writing, and you just kind of uh, let us – you didn't just make a point and then pontificate about it. You gave us a a real-life example of what you were talking about, or vice versa, to kind of lead us there. So I was very impressed. So first of all, Scott – I think my listeners would be really interested to hear that LinkedIn has a head of mindfulness and compassion that, and that's you. That is me. (laughs) And and I loved your first email to me. You you said, I hope this finds you in the middle of a smile. And I think I wrote back, well, not really. (laughs) It wasn't that great a day, but it was obvious to me that you were asking me from the very get go of our knowing one another to check in with my present. Mm. And that was real nice. So just kind of, can you give the listeners a synopsis of how you got to be the head of (laughs) mindfulness and compassion at LinkedIn? Sure. Sure. Well, it's not something I planned when I was 18. That is, that is for sure. (laughs) Uh, I had this kind of career where I was following my nose. You know, I got, I got an engineering degree. I went into sales because I like people. Then I went into management because I I thought I'd be a better manager than a salesperson. Yeah. And I ended up at LinkedIn as the, the VP of global customer operations. So essentially running customer service and all of the customer facing stuff. That's not sales, you know, and it's a big job. It's like thousand people Uh, organization, right. Handling whatever, 10,000 customer cases a day. Sure. And I've also had this kind of parallel path where I was a seeker. You know, I I found a a really personal kind of spiritual path when I was 13. And that started a a meditation or contemplation practice when at that age. That's quite young to start. It's quite young, quite young. I was teaching uh, when I was 19 or 20 in college. Wow. Um, I became a member of the clergy in that path you know, a number of years ago. So that part has been a big part of me, but mm-hmm. it's not something I ever talked about at work. Right. And then I came so to the LinkedIn. two were yeah. co- concurrent, but not, a joint, not, not a joint. Okay. So two like really important parts of my life, two parts of my identity, but never all in the same place. Okay. Right. And so n- nine years ago, I came to LinkedIn and pretty soon realized it's a such an open place. You know, the CEO was talking about his own practice using headspace he was talking oh. about compassion. And I thought maybe this is a place where I can bring, you know, my, my meditation practice in a secular way in an, in a, in, to work. And long story short, I, I got over myself. It was kind of scary, but I got over myself <laughs> and I led that first session. And it was on a 4.30 in the afternoon on a Thursday in the, get this, the heavenly conference room. Oh, my which, God. Which I thought was quite. I feel like I'm hearing like some angels in the background. Yeah, right. (laughs) 
<laughs> exactly. And that, that first time there was one dude there <laughs> and it was just me and him. And I, I'm sure he was just as terrified as I was because I never saw him, you know, again after that. <laughs> but the next week there were three and the week after there were five and it became a regular thing. And then well, people knew that I did it. This is in-house. Yeah, this is in-house. And I'm, yeah. still, I'm still the VP of operations. I'm still, you know, I was volunteering to do this. Um, and that went on for three or four years. And I got invited to do bigger and bigger and bigger things because people knew I did it. So the marketing team would have a, an offsite and have these big breakout sessions with 80 people. And I'd lead meditation sessions for these breakout sessions. How oh, very cool. Or the CFO would have a, a summit. And we'd kick off the whole thing. I'd lead a meditation for 15 minutes for these 400 finance people before they did their you know, big meeting. And that was great because now it was all part of my identity. My identity was all of my whole body, which is, which is what I wanted in the first place, right? I didn't have to cover this part anymore. AKA full body, yes, right? Exactly. <laughs> but then for me, the tipping point was our CEO gave the commencement address at Wharton three years ago, and he's an alumni there. And he talked about compassion, right? In your mm -hmm. commencement address, you get your one big piece of advice. Yeah. If you're going to be successful in life and at work, be compassionate. And he told his own story. And then he's on TV the next day. And this is all the reporters want to talk about is compassion in leadership. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, okay, it's time. It's time for me because I'd been in my ops role for six years. I was ready to do something else. But it's also time for LinkedIn because our CEO just told our 16,000 employees compassion is the most important thing that you can do. And then we sent them all back to their desks. And so that's amazing. But what, what does that mean? What, yeah, now what, what? what does that look like? Right. <laughs> right. So I made a pitch to him and to our head of HR. And three years ago, we essentially created this role. And so my job, I, I changed my tagline on LinkedIn is to change work from the inside out. That's the mm -hmm. vision. And then the mission is two parts. It's to mainstream mindfulness and to operationalize compassion. So that's kind of how we got here and a little bit about what it is. That's really fascinating. I'm reminded of a guy, and I, I don't know where and when, but he made a similar point in a graduation speech about kindness, that mm. if he had it to do all over again, he would be much more kind than he had been. Yeah. Okay, so you are really, you've become more aware of compassion in the workplace, and I was struck by two examples in your book that to me were sort of, uh, it was like the one was the, the side of the rock where you were the supervisee and the yes. other side of the rock was when you were a supervisor. <laughs> okay. Right, right. And you talked about early in the book that you'd been told that you needed to do more. Yes. And no yes. one gave you a definition of that. And some, some guy found him Malmood, I get, yeah, in front yeah. of you. And, and you say, well, I, I think I'm doing fine. He goes, uh, no, you're really not doing fine. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And yet he said, I'm going to help you. And yeah. then later in the book, quite a bit later, you were the supervisor and a guy named Roman or Roman said, you know, he didn't have executive presence. Right. And what in the hell was that? Right. And no one had really been able to explain it to him. And then so I'm just wondering if in your own mind, these stories are related. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why they're there. Yeah. Because the thing about compassion is we're on either side of the fence, you know, every day, every single day we're, we're, we're the one who does something wrong and then we're the one that is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And so actually, one of my friends has a great story about, hey, you know how to change someone else? He's like, oh, I have that down here. Yeah. The three steps to changing someone else. <laughs> right? Yeah, I've He's got like, it. It's number five. <laughs> yeah. So well, I'll, I'll, I'll tie the two together. It. No, go ahead and tell it. He says, look, if you want to change someone else, here's how you do it. It's a three-step process. You may want to get a pen out and you know, write this down. And I'm all excited. I'm like, yeah, because, you know, there's a lot of people in my life that I would like to change. <laughs> He's like, oh, the first step is to think about all the ways this person is upsetting you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's easy, right? All the ways this person is upsetting you and, and why it matters to you, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second step, once you really get an understanding of that, the second step is to think about all the ways that you've done something similar to this person. Right. And then, oh, well, only to this much... person or just in general? No, just gen in general. Oh, okay. Right. So, so if you feel like someone cheated you or did you wrong, it's like, okay, well, how, when are all the times that you've cheated someone else or did them wrong or whatever that was? Mm -hmm. And that's less fun to write down. <laughs> and you, you start write down, writing down all those things for number two. And then you imagine, well, what's the impact it had on those other people? Right. And then step three is 
there is no step three. <laughs> yeah, I loved that. It was like, oh. <laughs> That's it. So in other words, in other words, every day in every moment, we're on both sides of the coin, right? There's there's times mm-hmm. when we get it wrong and there's times that the one that is wrong. And this is the root of compassion because we start to see how, oh, it's everyone else is very similar to me, right? And we're we're all just trying to get by. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. But when we see others and realize, oh, I've done what they've done too, then it gives I, us a little more compassion. For you them. know, I have a similar thing that I often say, you know, I'm a psychologist and that I often a therapist and I often say this to my patients. Often when you find something in someone else that's highly irritating, it's something that you have prided yourself on that you try very mm. hard not to be. And you yeah. kind of look at that person and say, how could anybody like him? He's so, he's so impatient or he's so full of himself. And then I said, but you are that as well. And that's why you don't want to be that way because you've acted <laughs> right. that way. So it's that's very right. similar. I had to smile when I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. There's the next, well, I don't know about next level, but there's another way of looking at that that I've found when, when something really irritates me. And this is like black belt level. But when something really irritates me to stop and say, thank you. Because it's triggered something inside that is clearly a growth edge, right? I'm right. not able to, quote, handle it. Because I'm being knocked off balance. I'm getting emotional about something. Mm. Not that that's bad, but it's just an awareness. So this thing that's upsetting me, I can say, thank you. And then then I can start to have the inquiry. Like, why is this upsetting me? What mm. is it about this that's, you know, is one of my, are one of my values violated in this moment? Right? And it gives me an opportunity to go within and think, okay, well, if I was fully centered, like, how would I handle this differently? Okay, so so let me ask you something. Let me stop you for just a second. Yeah. I'm sitting here. I'm from Fayetteville, Arkansas, yep. and I'm sitting here thinking about the people that might be listening to this that are plumbers or yep. work in corporations where compassion is not being talked about. Sure. Sure. How do you think, and I'm no, maybe there are a lot of compassionate plumbers out there. Don't, <laughs> I don't want to get a lot of hate. You know there are. Yeah, of course there are. They're, you know, they're compassionate toward me frequently when I don't know what I'm doing. Sure. But I'm just trying to think how you want this message to come across to mm. people who say, but I don't, I don't work in an environment where someone is head of mindfulness sure. and compassion. That's so, a great point. Yeah. So what would you, how would you like for them to use this information? Because it's really, it's story after story of real life, just examples of exactly these concepts you're talking about. Sure. Let me start with a Rumi quote, because I think Rumi says a lot of things that I like to say, he says them better. So he says, yesterday I was clever and I tried to change the world. And today I am wise and I'm working on myself. So this is what I mean by changing our work and the world from the inside out. It starts with us. Now, sometimes we have influence over our company or the world around us. And, then, and we'll, let's save that part for later. But what I mean is, yes, if you are, you know, on the front lines at a big company and you feel like a cog in the machine and you don't have a lot of, a lot of control over the company, the thing we do have control over, more control over, is our own minds, how we react to things. Right. And we can turn any situation, nearly any situation, into one that's positive and full of growth and full of love and joy. And that's really what the book is about. It's like, regardless of the hand that I'm dealt, how am I going to play that hand? And then it goes on to even be more powerful if we are a leader at that company or if we are the head plumber of wherever we are, then we can change Literally, we can change the company based on the same principles. Mm -hmm. But it does start with us and taking responsibility for the things that we can be responsible for. There are several threads in the book. Presence is one of them, being very present. Mm -hmm. Another theme is that life doesn't happen. It makes me think about what you're saying now. Life doesn't Mm -hmm. happen to you. But first you point out it happens for you. I'd love for Mm -hmm. you to talk about that. Life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. And then later in the book, you say it happens through you. Yes. So it happens so, for you and it happens through you. Can you explain that a little bit more? Absolutely. I think all of us go through this development um, and this is kind of the arc of development. We start by thinking that, you know, life is just happening to us. We feel a little bit victimized by life, right? Oh, it's somebody else's fault or it's the big corporation's fault or the big government's fault. And, you know, it's happening to us. Mm-hmm. 
But if we shift in responsibility, even if you don't believe the world works this way, like I believe the world works this way, but even if you don't believe it, like what if you responded to life as if that lesson, that thing you're going through was put there on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine if life worked this way, what if you were getting ready before this life and you were talking to your teacher and you're like, oh, in this lifetime, I really need to learn patience. Okay, great. Who, who do you want to bring along with you to learn patience? And you're like, oh, I'm going to choose like a pickup basketball game at recess. I'm going to choose her and him and her. Right. And then, you know, later you find your 16, you find yourself with this, your 16 year old daughter who is teaching you a lot about patience (laughs) or a pandemic. How about that one? Or a pandemic that's teaching you a lot about patience. Now, in the beginning, we feel like, oh, wow, I'm just a victim. Like who, who would want this situation? But what if we shifted to say, wow, what if we had a hand in putting this here? Mm -hmm. Or what if I responded as if this lesson was put here for me? How would I respond to it differently? I'd, then I could say thank you for these hard things. It's like, wow, I really want to learn patience. And now, wow, this is a, a big opportunity for me to learn. And that's patience. what you mean is it happens for you. It is yes. like a, it's like something that if you see it more that I want to grow through this. And yes. so many people ask me during the pandemic and well, we're still ongoing, but yes. They've said, why do I have to be living in this time? You know, and I'll uh-huh. look at them and say, well, you know, I don't imagine that people who are living through the bubonic, bu- <laughs> bubonic plague, whatever, bubonic, right. yeah, there you go, or yeah. World War II or the Great right. Depression or, or Vietnam, all those people or, in China. And I, sure. I was lucky enough to visit China and they had these incredible, you know, government coups and Anyway, yes. so you don't get to choose, you know, when you're what you're going to be living through. And I, right. I tried to help people understand that right. it was kind of a if they got stuck there, they were just going to be stuck in bitterness. That's right. And what's interesting is by almost all measures, this is the best time in our history. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. We're, we're relatively more healthy. We're relatively richer, even with the divide between the rich and the poor. Even the poor are relatively richer than the poor have been. Um, we live longer, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's this thing, I believe, which is pain is pain. Right. So if I say, well, I know somebody who is a Holocaust survivor. And so clearly my life can't be as hard as them. So no matter what I'm going through, it's not as bad as what they went right, through. Right, right, right. There's something to that. And no matter who we are as people, when we experience pain, it's still pain. Exactly. Right? So we, we from the outside shouldn't say, oh, well, you shouldn't feel pain because we are so much better off than things were 100 years ago. Maybe, but at the same time, it's still something real that we're going through as people. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of both sides. And what do you mean it happens through you? Yes. So I think that when we are fully aligned to that deepest part of us, and whatever your worldview is on that, right? If you believe that that's some sort of divine part of you or just that, that deepest part where you're at your best, when we're fully aligned there, then I, I believe that we come, we become a coworker with life. And life can start to happen through us, right? We, it's like moving from the student to be the teacher, mm-hmm. right? Or, or, or being instead of the Oz behind the curtain, you become the Oz behind the curtain, you mm-hmm. know? And it, this is where the magic happens. I think this is where our fulfillment happens, our joy happens, and our creativity as that deepest part of us really happens. It can flourish. You know, when I was uh, in my mid 40s, I was in a a musical and it was a beautiful musical and everybody in it did a great job. And one of the younger cast members wrote me this note and said, I hope when I'm your age that I'm kind of like you. And at first I was like, I'm just 45. (laughs) (laughs) What do you mean my age? (laughs) When I'm 65. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so at first it was like, oh gosh, what does this mean? And then I thought, you know, somehow it was a rare and wonderful compliment to be told, yeah. I see something in you. So, yeah. you know, I, I got to feel that, that someone was noticing how I made hopefully life. I was living something and through myself. That's right. And that was important. That's right. And I think all of us do this, right? It does, it's not, doesn't happen all at once, like you become enlightened and all of a sudden you're that person. But there's parts of our lives where we live it 
And people right. want to be near us because they sense that thing, just like the, the cast member you were talking about. They wanted to be close to you. I want what you have. Mm-hmm. That's that feeling. It hadn't happened much. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it happens more than you would care to Okay, say. so let's talk about, I loved these. My listeners know I'm all about what you can do about it, okay? I mean, yeah. not that all mental health issues can be solved lickety-split. They can't, obviously. But I, there's often something, at least, even if it's supposedly small, something you can do yeah. about it. And you talk about unconditional giving. And yes. these small ways you can do that. I believe there's six of them, and I love them. Can you talk about that? <laughs> I don't know if I can rattle off all six. But I've got let's them. Don't worry. I can, I, can, uh, okay. I, can, I can hint <laughs> so to I Talk about micro compassions. Yeah, right? I love That's that kind of term. An antidote to microaggressions or just yes. a counterpoint. And my point is that I talk about compassion and operationalizing compassion in our lives and in work. And my point is it doesn't have to be complicated. Mm-mm. It doesn't have to be this big thing where you have to go save the world. So here are some really small things that you can do. So as an example, you're standing in grocery line, and instead of getting lost in your phone, just Look at someone in line and smile. Exactly. And maybe start up a conversation, human to human, mm. right? And I, I play this game sometimes where I try to get people to laugh. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay, how many, like, what, what can this guy looks kind of grumpy right now? Can, you know, is he a fair target for this? <laughs> and it doesn't always work, you know? So, you know what? Work. Note how this man looks because if he walks up to you at the grocery store, you might, you might want to get in another line if you're in a bad mood. <laughs> you might want to get in my line. <laughs> you might want to get in your line. That's right. <laughs> exactly. So just smile, right? Or somebody at work or one of your friends, it's just anything to build connection. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking, hey, how are you today? In which case you're always going to get, oh, fine. Mm -hmm. And that's it, right? And sometimes when somebody asks you, then you just see the back of them because they're continuing to walk down the hall. They weren't even, it was just that they They weren't weren't even asking. Talk about not being present. They weren't present. Mm -hmm. So I think a better way is like, hey, how are you? Like, really, how are you today? And if you get the fine, I'm like, okay, well, how about on a scale from one to 10? How are you today? Mm Oh, I'm a, I'm a seven. Okay, great. Well, what is your normal? Like, what's your every day? Oh, normally I'm an eight. Oh, all right, well, what's different? It's like, see what I'm saying? Like you, oh, you're listening, like you really are there for them. Like you really want to know how they are, mm-hmm. which is, and here's the thing as people, I think one of our most deeply held needs as a person is the need to be seen and heard mm-hmm. and acknowledged and ultimately loved. Right. But it starts with just the, I see you. Well, and, and this ties so in with good. the others because you talk about curiosity, remaining curious, yeah. listening. There's yeah. then just this sense of inclusion, noticing maybe when someone is being left out of a discussion or a conversation yep. and yep. pulling them in, including them in compliments is your other. Yeah. It's easy yeah. to give a compliment, you know? Yeah. Um, it's easy. We're, we're so stingy with our gratitude and our compliments. Right. There's so many things in our life that we're happy about, but we tend to look at the negative stuff. Oh, man, I call it pothole management. So this is the opposite (laughs) of what we're talking about. There can be a thousand miles of perfect road. Right. And if there's one pothole, we spend our entire time focusing on the one pothole. And that's true with our projects at work. It's true with how we view ourselves. It's true of how we even view our friends, our spouses, our kids. But the antidote to this is to focus on the gratitude. Like, okay, yes, it's true that this one pothole, whatever, she leaves the cupboards open when she leaves for work, whatever it is, like whatever that thing that she's doing is annoying. My husband always, he will unload the dishwasher, but when for the about 47th time, he can't Uh remember where something goes, he just puts it at the back of the counter. (laughs) Yeah. So, So that's true. That's true. And you could spend 99% of your time thinking about that one thing that he does that drives you insane. And that's real. But there's probably 99 other things to that one thing that he does that's great. And this is why you're together. And and the the challenge with the mind is we focus on that one thing and not the 99. Mm -hmm. So our question to ourselves is, hey, what else is true? And then to not be so stingy with our gratitude, right? To be, to be welcoming. Instead of just telling him that one thing that annoys you, it's like, do we <laughs> tell him the 99 things that are great? Well, if you're like most people, probably not. 
<laughs> but this well, is how and we I, I think that's about. true. And I, I will be working with couples, and someone will wisecrack. What I'm supposed to thank him for everything he does? And I said, well, thank him for. I mean, if you want to be thanked and you want to set up a kind of a grateful dynamic between the two of you every now and then both of you will note i know you do this every day and i so appreciate you doing it you know and so yeah yeah, it is kind of that listen we've got time for one more thing because i just think it's such an important point could you tell the samaritan story yes so many of you already know the story of the good samaritan i'll give the synopsis if you don't it's a story from the bible that jesus tells and so this um, this man, a Levite, a, a Jewish man, was walking down the road and gets beaten up and robbed, and he's left for dead on the side of the road. And first, someone from his own group, his own tribe, another Levite, walks by and sees him and just keeps on walking. Mm-hmm. And then a priest from his same tribe, you know, another Levite, sees him. He's like, oh, and just keeps on walking. All right. And then a third person, a Samaritan, a person from the rival group, right? This is like, they did not like each other, or think very well of each other. He sees the man and just like, he's not going to leave him. So he gathers him up on his animal. He takes him to the next town. He puts him up in the, you know, in the inn and makes, and then leaves money for the innkeeper to make sure that the man gets back on his feet. And he says to the innkeeper, hey, spend whatever you need to get this guy back going. I'll, I'll pay you the rest when I get back to town. Right. So that's the story of the Good Samaritan. And it's a story about compassion that every sure. you know, six year old from Sunday school or um, synagogue knows. Right. OK. So in the 70s, they did this study of young men who, are at, who were at seminary. This was at Princeton. And they wanted to see, you know, what would happen. So they they divided the men into two groups. And in one group, they were going to tell the story, give a speech, you know, tell the story of the Good Samaritan. And in the other half, they were going to tell just any random story. It could have been like what service as a minister was going to be like. And they were in one room, but the, they were going to give their talk in another room. And they had to walk through a hallway and down a courtyard and go left and right. And they had a little map that they were given to go to this place. Okay. And so they were preparing in one place and going to another place to give their talk to the senior ministers. And then they divided these two groups again into two. And they gave one half of the group low hurry instructions like, hey, you know, John, uh, they're going to be waiting for you. You can make your your way over. Yeah, take your time. You're good. Like, but, you know, you should make your way over sometime soon. And to the other half, they gave high hurry instructions like they looked at their watch and went, oh, oh, I'm really sorry. Like, but you're late now. Like, you need to hustle over there because they're waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then and then what they did was they put an actor in the middle in the courtyard, in the hallway, someone to be this, you know, he was moaning, he was acting like he was in pain, he was suffering. And these young men had to walk right by him. In some oh. cases, they had to step over him. Jeez. Oh, now, gosh. remember, half of them are giving a talk about the Good Samaritan. Right? And, about their clergy, someone, after, and their clergy. And they're clergy. They're clergy, you know, they're, clerical, cler- you know, right, they're to- clergy in training. So they're mm-hmm. all like these pious young men who are born to serve. And you think, okay, well, did it matter what story they were telling? Did they stop? It turns out it didn't matter at all if they told a story about the Good Samaritan or if they told a story about what it was going to be like to serve. But what did matter was time. Mm -hmm. So if they were given low hurry instructions versus if they were in a hurry, they were six times more likely to stop. So for me, incredible statistic. Right. Six times. So for me in my own life, and you, you know this, if you look in your heart of those of you who are listening, when you are so busy, when I am so busy, I don't think about anybody but myself. Mm-hmm. I'm just going from one thing to the next. And I'm, it's me, 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 me. But when we give ourselves a little space, you know, schedule a little time in between meetings, give ourselves that time to go pick up our kids from school, whatever it is, if I give ourselves some time, then we have a chance. We have a chance to live all these great intentions that we have. Because right. these young men had all the intentions in the world. Right. But they didn't have time to execute. That ties in, I think, with, with the last thing I really want to talk about. And you, you talked about 
I th- I don't know if it was you that you were holding on to an old dream, which of course, mm, when yes, we hold on to those dreams, we're very, very driven. And if it hasn't happened yes. yet, it should have happened yesterday. Yes. And we're shaming ourselves for it. And then you say, I think you said, I've never been more miserable than when I was holding <laughs> on to an old dream. Yes, yes. Yeah, as uh, you know, I was I was raised to achieve. My whole life strategy was to achieve, achieve, mm-hmm. achieve. And there were times in my life where I was successful at pretty much everything. I did very well in school. I did very well in my career. And no amount of achievement could fill that hole in my heart, right? For me, that that true fulfillment comes from the inside out. And so all this achievement is looking for external validation, for someone else to give me the blue ribbon, for someone else to say, "At a boy." But instead, what I learned is like, the true joy comes from the inside out. And I saw a real parallel, again, in reading the book and looking for stories that sort of made a similar point, but you were, you were on down the road in your own evolution of making that mm. point, was when mm. you were in Tokyo mm. and your wife was having a miscarriage. Yes. And you made fulfilling the expectations of those Japanese executives more important because you were afraid of their yeah. reaction if you had said, hey, right family emergency and so it was about i'm chasing my dream of doing this thing in tokyo that i'm determined to do and it's gonna be this marvelous thing in my life it's a once in a lifetime opportunity right and yet you missed another once in a lifetime opportunity exactly exactly there for her it's and these are the choices maybe not so dramatic but these are the choices we make every day you betcha on how we invest our time in our career in our life and there's seasons sometimes it's the right investment to invest more in our career versus our family in that moment. And a lot mm-hmm. of times it's the family versus the career. And, and we're the only ones who really know that. And sometimes we don't know it till later. But what I've really come to believe, to realize is that no matter how important we think that job is and how in love we think we are with that job, that if we fast forward 15 years, mm-hmm. every one of those jobs turns into three bullets on a resume, right? Three bullets on a LinkedIn profile. And all those external validation, all this way that we've been keeping score fades. And the true way we'll keep score is the connections, our loved ones, right? When we're old and we're sitting, you know, in the last days of our life, we're not going to care what level we made it to in our careers. We are going to care if we're totally alone or if we're surrounded by people that completely love us unconditionally. Mm -hmm. That will be how we keep score in the end is the, the keeping score of the heart. What is it? Maya Angelou says people will remember you, not I say not for something, yeah. but but for the way not you made for what them you feel. said, but how not you for made what you feel. said, but how you made them feel. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's right. So, your book is full body. Yes. Uh-huh. How? What do you think it offers as far as what is the audience you're hoping will read this book? Sure. Well, on the one hand, it's for everybody because I think there's stories in there that will be for everybody. Oh, I, the, agree. The, I agree. The center. The center of the bullseye, I think, is for people who are working and they're asking themselves, seriously, is this all there is? Like, is Mm -hmm. this all there is to work? Is this all there is to life? Like, surely there's more than this, right? And it's for everybody who feels that way. And so there are stories in here about how we start to change our lives from the inside out, how we change our mindsets. And I think there's a story in there that will resonate with every single person who reads it. I have 13 year olds who are preparing to get ready for high school who are reading it. They're they're college kids who are getting ready for preparing for life. Uh, Retired, you know, 80 year old grandmas are reading it and and finding it relevant. So on the one hand, it's, it's not great because it's for everybody and it doesn't have a super specific target market, but that's also the beauty of it is that no matter who picks it up, you're going to find a story that resonates. Well, sure. Thank you so much for being here. And, and again, I've always worked for myself, both in the music world. I guess in the music world, I, I, I obviously work for jingle producers and that kind of thing. But for a long time now, I've only worked for myself. And I actually found the book very, very meaningful. And, and it reminded me of some things that I, I love to be reminded of. And it also uh, taught me some things, especially some of the stories were very, very evocative of of the way I like to think about things and, and then gave me some fresh, a fresh approach to do that. So I thank you very much. Well, thank you for uh, having me. I appreciate it. And take good care. 
Thank you. And yes, there's a smile on my face. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. It brought a smile to my face listening to it again. He's really an intriguing man and someone who I think is trying to do a lot of good in our workplaces and in our lives. So thank you, Scott, for being on. I can't believe that self-work has almost been going for five years. We're trying to think up some fun ideas of how to celebrate that. My own book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, is published and is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or Go give your local bookstore a a little business. It'll help them out. I hope you'll like it. It's in ebook, audiobook, or paperback. And certainly, I talk a lot about compassion and self compassion. Thanks for leaving the reviews for the podcast on Apple. We're almost up to a thousand, or perhaps by the time you hear this, we will have reached 1,000 reviews. I would love that. Just kind of a kick. Thank you all for being here. I have a Facebook closed group as well. If you'd like to stay in touch with me that way or via my website at drmargaretrutherford.com or email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. I'm grateful you were here today. Please take very, very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self-Work.